Many thanks, Andy Guitar and Elise Hobson, for your fabulous leadership and dedication in launching Venture Houston 2021 so successfully. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Gina Luna to you. Gina Luna is a veteran and respected board member, investor, and a stellar Houston civic leader. I have never encountered a more dedicated, visionary, and courageous civic leader anywhere. With great generosity and leadership, Gina consistently uses her influence for the benefit of Houston. And all of us Houstonians are very blessed to have Gina working on some major strategic issues that matter. Gina's career is most impressive. She is founding partner of GP Capital Partners and chief executive officer of Luna Strategies. She's also currently a board member of two public companies, Roku and Tetra. She has held various senior executive positions with J.P. Morgan Chase. She's currently a board member of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas Houston branch and is also the chairman of the St. Luke's Health System here in Houston. She also serves as a trustee of the Texas A&M Foundation, the Welsh Institute, the Welsh Foundation, and the Baylor College of Medicine. In the past, Gina has also uh, served as the greater, as chairman of the Greater Houston Partnership. At HX Venture Fund, we are privileged to have Gina as a trusted senior executive advisor. Please help me welcome Gina Luna to Venture Houston 2021. Good morning. Thank you, Guillermo, for that kind introduction. I'm thrilled to participate in Venture Houston 2021 and excited to welcome everyone that's joining us this morning. I know that this is going to be a great two days of incredible conversations about innovation, entrepreneurship, partnership, and impact. And I want to offer a huge thanks to the outstanding team that has worked so hard to create this forum. Um, before we begin this morning, I want to gather a bit of information about our audience. So we have two quick poll questions that are going to pop up on your screen. Um, would appreciate if you would click on those. The first will ask you about your role, and the second will ask about your geography. And as everyone clicks on those questions, it is my great pleasure to welcome our very special guest, Steve Case. And while I could spend an hour talking about Steve's background and his incredible achievements, I'm going to trust that everyone has read his bio and knows a great deal about all that he has done. Um, and I really want to get right to the conversation that we're going to have this morning. So I'm just going to summarize by saying that as an entrepreneur and an innovator, an investor, an advocate, and a philanthropist, Steve is truly a pioneer and a leader that does well and does good. And I know he has invaluable insights and wisdom that he's gonna share with us this morning. Um, so again, um, before we jump right into that conversation, I want to invite all of you to post your questions to the chat box. Um, as we go through this, I'll try to incorporate some of your questions along with those that I have for Steve. I think I could, ask Steve questions for hours, but I'll try to uh, bring in the audience input as well. Um, so while we're waiting for the poll question or the poll responses to come back, I'm gonna just turn to Steve and ask you to tell us um, a bit about revolution. Let's just start there. Sure, well, first of all, it's great to, great to be with everybody. I'm super excited what's happening all across the country with innovation, entrepreneurship, and a lot of, obviously a lot in Texas, and particularly in, in Houston. So this is a great conference and I'm, I'm delighted uh, that so many people are focusing on the role that startups play in driving innovation, but also driving job creation and the, frankly, the investment opportunity and backing the startups, not just in places like Silicon Valley, but also in places like uh, Houston. It's you know, iconic because of the, you know, the role Houston played in with uh, NASA and space is this phrase, Houston's got a problem. The way I look at it, Houston's got an opportunity to really emerge as one of the leading startup cities in, in the country and the momentum around what's happening and including the, this, this conference, I think gives me great confidence that it's, it indeed is on the rise and it's exciting to see. To your, to your question, Revolution, I should a little bit of backstory. Uh, I, did, uh, I was a co-founder of America Online 35 years ago here in the Washington DC area. Uh, at the time, only 3% of people were online, and those 3% were online one hour a week. 
So quite a bit different than the always on, particularly given the pandemic and, you know, kind of living in Zoom land these days. But it's been fascinating to watch that develop over the last several decades. Uh, I stepped aside as CEO 20 years ago when we merged AOL with Time Warner and then started making investments and then formalized it about a decade ago by creating Revolution, trying to build it into one of the top investment firms in the, in the country, but with a bias of investing outside of Silicon Valley. So much capital goes to Silicon Valley and also some other big cities like New York and, and Boston. Not enough goes to Houston and, and you know, Denver and Chicago, LA, you know, Atlanta, other, other sorts of cities. So our, our bias is towards backing the entrepreneurs in those other places, what we call the rise of the rest uh, cities. And over the last decade, it's, it's evolved to now be a couple billion dollars uh, under management. Uh, most of that, two thirds of that is in, in our revolution growth you know, fund. We've done two funds there in the process of doing a, a third fund that's back in companies like Big Commerce in, in Austin that went public uh, quite successfully last year. Now is a five, $6 billion market, market value. Uh, we also have Revolution Ventures, which is more of a series A kind of an investor and actually uh, HX is a partner on that, which is, which is great. And the more recent fund is our Rise the Rest Seed Fund uh, where we're, we're making early stage, very early stage seed investments. So far we've made 150 investments in 70 cities just over the past you know, three years. And the interesting thing about that, our Revolution Growth and Revolution Ventures are more traditional institutional LPs or investors in that. On the Rise of the Rest Seed Fund, it's, it's individuals, including you know, people like uh, Jeff Bezos and Howard Schultz and Eric Schmidt and Meg Whitman and Tori Birch and uh, Jim Breyer, John Doerr, Henry Kravis, Mike Bloomberg, you know, uh, uh, you know, a ton of, ton of about 35 people that really are joining us to make these investments, partly to shine a spotlight on what's happening in places like Houston. Most people maybe in Houston know, but most people around the country don't know that Houston's now a lot more than oil and gas and it's a real leader, obviously, in the, in the healthcare space. And also we're seeing a lot of innovative companies across many sectors of of our economy. So for me, it's been a fun you know, journey initially as an entrepreneur and then uh, more recently as a investor, mentor, partner, uh, uh, trying to really help mobilize uh, more startup communities, more, more action and more places, uh, get, get more entrepreneurs in more parts of the country, kind of a shot at building a company, kind of a shot at the American dream. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a fun journey. Well, and you were such a leader in that regard, and it's been fantastic to see so many people follow you in, um, you know, thinking about opportunity in all these other places. I can certainly speak for Houston. We thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and, and it's, you know, part of it's actually attracting the capital, but it's also just raising the awareness of uh, what's going on in other parts of the country and helping people see that that opportunity exists. Um, as you look forward, do you see continuing that strategy for revolution or what, what do you think is next in terms of your funds? No, absolutely. We will continue that strategy. We, we believe we, we have our strategy at revolution across growth ventures and seed. Uh, we call the four P's, which we think will help define uh, and drive the next wave of innovation. Uh, one is place, which ties in with uh, what, the, what we're talking about with the rise of the rest, not just thinking about innovation in Silicon Valley, thinking about it all across the, you know, the country. So place, we believe, is, is going to be very important in the next you know, 10, 20 years. Policy is the second P. We think that's going to be very important. The, 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 you know, the last wave, what I've thought of the second wave of the internet, I've obviously played a role in the first wave, getting everybody online. The second wave was essentially building apps and software on top of the internet, things like Facebook and many other, other things. Uh, the third wave to me is when the kind of internet meets the real world uh, and you really do start innovating and transforming how we think about healthcare and food and agriculture, things like that. And those are, are sectors that have regulations associated with them. And so you have to understand that, be respectful of that. So we think policy is going to become much more important for this third wave of, of, of the internet. So that's a big focus for us. We also focus on partnerships. We think the, the, the most iconic companies in the next uh, wave are going to be co companies that figure out ways to create a network of alliances around what they're, they're doing. We backed a company in Chicago, for example, called Tempest that's focused on precision medicine. The reason that's now a very, very valuable company, they just raised money last month at an $8 billion valuation, is because of the partnerships they formed with some tech players, but also most of the major national cancer institute hospitals are now part of their, their data set. So partnerships is going to be very important. 
And the final one is positioning. We really think companies need to be able to tell their stories, just as cities need to be able to tell their stories. So those four P's kind of drive what we're doing and, and, and we'll continue to execute against that you know, strategy at the seed venture and, and growth level where the growth will be for us over the next year is we're doing another uh, growth fund and, and to back the more companies like a big commerce and, and uh, uh, you know, Tempest, a company like DraftKings that went public uh, last year. So it's been, it's been really fun to see what's happening. I spent a good bit of time over the last decade uh, traveling around the country. Uh, uh, we, I was asked about 10 years ago to uh, chair an initiative called Startup America, launched at the White House, and that got me traveling around and opened my eyes to some of the problems we have, but also some of the opportunities we have. And we started doing our Rise of the Rest bus tour now six or seven years ago. So far, we've driven 43 different cities and really try to understand what's what's happening there and, and try to figure out what we can do to drive more collaboration there, create more of a culture of risk-taking innovation, you know, fearlessness really there, try to figure out ways to be a magnet for uh, for capital and also a magnet for talent. The last point I'll make, and Texas certainly has been a beneficiary of this, the pandemic we've all living through is obviously tragic in many respects. I saw just this morning, now we're up to 450,000 people have died. You know, millions and millions of people have lost their, their jobs. It's had a tragic impact on, on so many aspects of our country and indeed around the world. Uh, and I don't wanna make light of that, but I think there are a few silver linings that, that are, are, are starting to be evident. One is some trends have accelerated. You know, E-commerce obviously accelerated. Big commerce in Austin has benefited from that. Telehealth has accelerated. We've seen a company we back called Talkspace that's in the mental health, uh, digital mental health space accelerate because obviously with doctor's offices closed, people had to embrace telehealth and they realized actually it works pretty well. Uh, so we've seen an acceleration there, but also we've seen an acceleration we've long predicted, long hoped, maybe even long dreamed for, which is a boomerang of talent, getting people who left places like Houston to go to some other place like perhaps Silicon Valley uh, to return. Uh, and we really believe that may be where they want to live and raise a family. But more importantly, that's also where the big opportunities in this next third wave might be. Uh, we've seen a brain drain in most parts of the country over the last half century. If you just look at the data, most people growing up in certain you know, states, going to certain universities, some of our best universities, then leave to go someplace else because there's not as much opportunity there in their view than there was on the coast. That's starting to change. And I actually think this, this uh, pandemic, because people had to at least temporarily shelter, some of those people have decided to, to move uh, you know, permanently, whether it be entrepreneurs or, or, or companies or, or, or venture capitalists. I just last week, I talked to Jim Breyer, for example, one of the most storied Silicon Valley investors, the first investor in Facebook. He's also partnered with us on the Rise Rest. He decided to move to Austin. And there's more stories of, the, obviously, Elon Musk uh, made that decision uh, as well. So people, you know, I think people have been surprised that that's happened uh, over the past year. Some iconic Silicon Valley types are starting to move to Texas and Colorado and, and, and Utah and, and Florida and other, other places. Is we, we've long hoped for it, long predicted it, and I think the pandemic is accelerating that. That's going to be very, very important, I believe, in the next decade. Uh, if we see more of a dispersion of talent, that will lead to more of a dispersion of capital, which will lead to more of a dispersion of the creation of new companies, which will lead to more of a dispersion in terms of job growth and economic vitality in more parts of the, of the country. So again, I don't want to make any in any way light of the terrible tragedy of, of COVID. But I do think uh, some of the things we've been working on for the better part of a decade, such as the rise of the rest, likely will accelerate. This probably is a, a tipping point that will result in acceleration of that, which in the long run, I think will be great for the country. Well, I think we certainly have seen that and, and feel that Houston is a great beneficiary to your point. The pandemic has been horrible in so many ways, but you have seen it have an impact on companies and entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, in, in many ways, to your point, it's really accelerated other trends that would have taken much longer. Um, and I think you're right, uh, the capital to follow those opportunities will be key to, to being able to keep them here. As you know, that's the strategy with HX Venture Fund to try to attract more capital here. Um, I want to, uh, point out to our audience the on your site the recent report that you all put out um the rise of the rest 2021 ecosystem playbook i thought it was such a great resource and i love the examples you cite of you know what cities have done and what 
uh, startups have done in the midst of the pandemic. It's um, it's both encouraging and enlightening, I think. So I hope other people will will pull that down and and read it. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, we, this is the third one we publish, and they're freely available if you go to the revolution.com you know, website. And we, since we have spent a lot of time traveling around learning about different cities, what's working, what maybe is not working, we figured, why don't we share that with everybody so cities trying to figure out how to create more thriving startup communities can, can do that. And I also just want to build on your point about the importance of, of uh, firms like HX. So one of the things we do as we travel around the country is, is we do make investments in these cities. But one of the messages we deliver to people in those cities, if people in that community are not backing the entrepreneurs there, why should we? Or why should somebody else from some other place? If we need to make sure that, particularly that early seed and venture stage, that, that local regional capital is critically important. And even if you, I was talking recently with a, a group of, of, of major foundations around philanthropy, and of course they all have important causes. They care about hunger, housing, education, health, what, 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 maybe, maybe a lot of different things. Uh, but in some ways, the most important thing to focus on is, is, is vitality in the community. That is on the rise. Jobs are being created. There is economic growth. Therefore, there are taxes to pay for schools and, and social services and, and so forth. And that doesn't happen automatically. That happens because of innovation, job creation. And so if we're not focusing on startups, we're not going to create the communities we want you know, tomorrow. And this, frankly, was a surprise to me when I was asked to, to get involved in this, as I mentioned, 10 years ago by the, the White House. I was kind of mining on my own business as an entrepreneur and an investor, wasn't really focused that much on the policy side of things. And I was surprised to learn uh, that, that most of the jobs are created by startups, it's actually not by big companies. It's not by small companies, small businesses. Uh, they're important because they account for a lot of jobs, but they don't account for a lot of net new jobs. The net, net new jobs come overwhelmingly from new companies, startups, which led me on this path of saying, how do we back more startups in, in more places to create more jobs in more places? So I think it's great that people participating in this hopefully are are investors in, in HX or investing in some of the, the companies that, that, are, that are coming out of that. It's, it's critically important to create that vitality in terms of that base of, of capital, as well as mentorship and other things in, in, in every community. That's what's going to lead it to rise, driving more, more of that sense of possibility, more of a, of a you know, focus on collaboration, things like that. Well, and I think having people like you that are so credible advocating and telling that story is helpful. And, um, you know, the corporate support in Houston has been tremendous uh, in this regard. And I think it is a real recognition that this is something we need to do for the city and, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. Houston is clearly at an inflection point as it relates to the energy industry and, and what does Houston become for the future? And so it's, you know, I think it's such a can-do place and to see everyone rally around this in such a meaningful way and contributing their capital is a very uh, tangible way that they demonstrate that. But it's more than that and um, it, takes, it takes a lot of effort. No, I agree. One story that I, I want to share because it, it's somewhat uh, relevant, although it's also I think somewhat eye-opening, sobering, is the first stop of the first Rise the Rest tour we ever did, which now probably seven years ago, was in Detroit. And the reason we did that is we realized the backstory of Detroit that in, in many ways, Detroit 100 years ago was Silicon Valley. It was the most innovative city in the country. The automobile was the technology of the day. Everybody wanted to be part of the automobile revolution. Everybody wanted to move to to Detroit and, and as a result, houses were being built and schools were being built and all kinds of different things were happening. And it was rocking and rolling for several decades, but then kind of lost its edge and lost 60% of its population and then went bankrupt. And the reason is because they were too focused on one industry and too focused on presuming that that would stay in place. And we're not investing in the next, uh, you know, the industries of the future, not investing in the new companies of the future. They've turned that around. The last decade has been good momentum in, uh, in, in Detroit. We've been you know, delighted to see that. We made a number of investments ourselves in Detroit. But it is a reminder in a case like uh, Houston, uh, you know, the energy sector is, is under some pressure because of, of uh, new technologies and, and, and so forth. 
uh, and, and that will continue to be a, a strong industry for Houston. But if you are just assuming that that won't change, I think you'll probably end up being wrong. And if you assume that that's going to be the anchor industry uh, 25 years from now, you know, I think you also might be surprised. How, what are the new industries? And obviously having places like Texas Medical, that really can power a lot of innovation in the medical sector. That's one of many examples of Houston being able to kind of lean into the future and, and back some of the companies of the future, back some of it and help create some of the, the industries of the future. The final point, which also was a surprise to me, uh, is, is if you look at the data, about half of the Fortune 500 companies turn over every 25 years. There is this process of, you know, kind of creative destruction. Some are rising, some are some are, 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 are falling. So if you're not as a community investing in the new companies, some of your big companies are gonna go by the wayside. What's gonna replace them? Uh, and, and so that's why this is so important. Of course, we bring a investment lens. We wanna, like we did with big commerce, invest when it's worth a few hundred million dollars and someday it's worth, as it is now, many billions of dollars and that generates an investment return. Obviously that's a, a, a critical part of this, but there's a broader part of it as well in terms of thinking about you know, community development, think, thinking about more inclusive innovation. You know, how do you bring everybody along? How do you even try to bridge some of the divides in our country where there's some people who are doing really well and, and, and benefiting from the innovation economy? A lot of people are feeling kind of left out, left, left behind. How do we build the, some bridges and the work that you're doing and even this conference is trying to uh, you know, you know, move forward is, is critically important as part of that uh, response. Well, we often say we recognize that Houston is not entitled to prosperity. We, we must so keep fighting it. for it. And we, and we, must, uh, we must not be complacent and make sure that it benefits broadly. And, and so to your point, we, we are very focused on that. And I think maybe shifting the conversation uh, back to the third wave, I think Houston um, is so emblematic of the third wave because of the industrial type economy here. And, you know, it's um, our businesses have been more B2B rather than B2C. And so um, the connectivity uh, really resonates with us. So I, I, in preparation for our conversation, I reread the book that I read, I guess, almost five years ago when it came out. And, you know, I'm just struck by how clear your crystal ball was uh, in terms of projecting uh, so much of what was coming. And so I'd be curious from your perspective, um, what inning are we in of the third wave and, and what did you get right and what did you get wrong? Well, sure. Before I do that, Bill, on what we we're just talking about, thinking about Houston, the fourth largest city and also one of, if not the most diverse cities, as we think about leveling the playing field, we shouldn't just think about place. We also should think about people. And the, the three data points just to share, uh, the, the National Venture Capital Association tracks this. And last year, 75% of venture capital in this country went to just three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts, 75%. The other 47 states, including Texas, fight over 25%. And of course, you know, everything's bigger in Texas. So it's a little bit bigger, but it's, you know, it's like 2%. Most, most places like Virginia, Ohio, Michigan are 1%. Uh, and so if you just look at that, it's kind of crazy that it, 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 it sort of and overwhelmingly in California, which is about half of all the venture capital, most of it is Northern California, that Silicon Valley area. So that's one problem we need to address. And that we talked about that with the rise of rest. But the other problem and opportunity that we need to focus on is if you look at the other data points around people, even though women represent 50 percent of our population, women on female entrepreneurs get less than 10% of venture capital. That's crazy. And black Americans are 13% of our population, but black founders get less than 1% of venture capital. So if you just look at that data, it's sort of a, it's clear that it does matter where you live and it does matter what you look like. It also kind of does, does matter who you know, whether you have a shot at, if you have an idea, you kind of have a shot at building a company, kind of a shot at the American dream. So we really need to address that. And to your question, and I do think, by the way, Houston, because it is so diverse, has has an opportunity, everybody in the community makes it a priority to create one of the most inclusive innovation economies in, in, in the country and, and really doing a better job of bringing everybody uh, into it, not just having it be you know, kind of limited to a, a certain certain kinds of people, went to certain schools and those certain, you know, kind of have certain networks. So trying to bring a bias towards inclusivity, I think is super important. In terms of the book, The Third Wave, I, I first should say I, I, I was re, I resisted writing a book because uh, I, I think like a lot of entrepreneurs, I'm I'm always interested in what happens next and not that interested in looking in the rearview mirror. 
what changed my view was I realized that some of the lessons in that first wave I mentioned about getting America online, building the internet, building the on-ramps, building the servers, building the content, building the services, et cetera, uh, you know, it required some of those you know, dynamics I talked about earlier, like partnership and, and, and policy. And while and then was followed by the second wave, uh, which was more about software, where that didn't matter that much. Actually, we need, we had 300 partners at AOL. Facebook had zero partners. They didn't need partners to scale because they were building on top of the existing internet infrastructure. In this third wave, and I mentioned it uh, before, uh, it, it's going to be impossible to be successful, I think, without partnerships. If you want to innovate in, 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 in healthcare, for example, the technology, of course, matters, but it's sort of the table stakes. The real action is going to be getting nurses and doctors to embrace it and hospitals to integrate it and health plans to pay for it and you know, governments to allow it. That's the difference between success and, and, and failure. So that what led me to kind of write the book. I thought some of those lessons from that first wave might actually be helpful to entrepreneurs trying to think about this next uh, next uh, you know, wave. And I think I'd mostly got it right in terms of kind of predicting what was going to happen in terms of some of the you know, the things around uh, you know, policy and the shift to more technology, you know, te technology meets policy kinds of businesses and the partnership aspect. Uh, I did write back then about the rise of the rest. It's frankly been slower you know, over the last five years than I, I would have thought. I th as I said earlier, I think the pandemic could be that tipping point accelerator, but the data, if you look at the, you know, how much goes to the three states hasn't changed that much since I, and since I wrote the you know, so book, that's one area where I think I was right about the prediction, but it was was uh, wrong about the time frame, which is, is often the case uh, with these things. Even with the with, as a co-founder of AOL, to me, when we started uh, back in 1985 it was sort of obvious that eventually we would live in a more connected world, but it actually took us about 10 years before we finally broke through. And even when we went public in 1992, we'd been at it for like seven, eight years. Uh, we had less than 200,000 customers. And when we went public, we raised $10 million in our IPO. It was worth $70 million. Nobody knew or cared what we were doing. It's like what is it, some niche hobbyist thing. What, what, what is that? Uh, and then, you know, the next decade, things really accelerated and ended up actually being the best performing stock of, of the decade. So I was you know, just a reminder, sometimes you can be right on the eventual outcome, but wrong on or, or just require a lot of persistence and patience to be there when that outcome happens. And I think some of the things I wrote about, such as the rise of the rest, I think that that, uh, you know, that fits in. You just have to some, realize that sometimes revolutions happen in evolutionary ways. And, and there is something around, you know, patience and persistence, which I've learned as I've gotten older. When I was younger, I was, I was certainly couldn't understand why it wasn't obvious to everybody why there was a benefit in, in getting online. Equally, I can't, you know, I have trouble understanding, but I'm a little more patient, you know, why, why it's so hard for entrepreneurs in places like Houston to raise capital and so easy for entrepreneurs in places like San Francisco to, to raise capital. But, but eventually we'll level the playing field. Well, I guess your forecasting is like the economists, right? They're they're eventually right. It's just, exactly. In, in you some predict the market like, declines. Eventually, the market's going to go down. Yes, that is true. Exactly <laughs> when is, is the harder part. Well, I'm I'm hearkening back to a conversation with my two teenage boys when I was telling them that I was going to visit with you and you know what you had done, and we talked about AOL, and and my older son said was that like the beginning of social media? And my husband and I kind of chuckled and we were like, that was the beginning of the internet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad they even heard of it because uh, you know, most, most kids, obviously, these things goes back to what I said before, the, you know, the nature of disruption. We went from a company that didn't exist to being the most you know, valuable uh, company in, in the Internet 20 years later, it frankly, is, has diminished significantly in terms of its relevance. Other companies, Google, Facebook, et, et cetera, have, have kind of come up instead. So that, that, as a result, it's just a reminder, even my own personal experience, of we disrupted a bunch of companies, went from this little company that nobody thought would ever survive to being a valuable, powerful, influential company, but then others came at it and, and did a better job, innovated more quickly, were more agile, you know, we're going where the puck was going, and eventually they rose and, and AOL declined. This is the nature of, of innovation, and we just need to recognize that and also need to recognize that the nature of innovation, it, there's some disruption aspect to it, which does destroy what's there, which does result in job loss in some of those companies and some of those sectors and some of those cities. That's, that, that's just the 
you know, history and even looking at agriculture, for example, 200 years ago, over 90% of us worked on farms. Now it's less than 2%. And it's because technology made it easier to, you know, grow more food with fewer people, which is a good thing in terms of feeding the world, but a bad thing in terms of jobs. Thankfully, we pivoted from that agricultural revolution to the industrial revolution, retrained people instead of working on farms to work on factories and did a pretty good job of, of making that, uh, you know, that transition. We've done a less good job in making the transition from the industrial revolution to the technology revolution. And that needs more, more attention in the, in the years to come. Well, and we can't, you know, uh, AOL is such a great example of you can't discount the incredible impact of a transformational kind of company like that. And you don't always recognize it you know, in the, in the time that it's happening. But and you, you also don't necessarily understand you know, some of the, the seeds you plant, even if you don't fully appreciate it at the time, end up blossoming in ways that are you know, unexpected. There are two, two examples. I remember meeting uh, Mark Zuckerberg, obviously the founder of Facebook, I don't know, 15 years ago. Facebook at the time was relatively small, but it started to show some momentum. And he was, you know, in his, I guess, early 20s, something like that, um, and was uh, came up to me at a conference and said, uh, I just want to meet you. And, and, and I just, I just want to let you know, almost apologetically, that when I was like 13, I was part of this hacker group that was trying to <laughs> hack into AOL. And, I, and he mentioned the group, and I, I actually knew, remembered the name. They were actually one of the better hacker groups. So it's like, That's but it kind of nice. like, so I said, well, I'm, I'm thank you for getting that off your chest. And <laughs> I'm glad we helped inspire your interest in, in coding and, and, and uh, in social media and, and so forth. And the other is, is, is uh, we had a, a service, uh, a instant messaging service with a buddy list that we called AIM, AOL Instant Messenger. Uh, and as part of that, you had the ability to kind of put your status up. You know, I'm, take, I'm leaving for a while or something. You know, what Twitter did very cleverly was basically take those status updates and create a persistent feed. And that essentially is Twitter. They were building on kind of hacking what was, what was done with instant messaging. That's the great thing about innovation. We were building on some of the early pioneers who put the first internet technologies in place, particularly when it's funded by DARPA, the, you know, the government. Others have built on top of what we're doing and kind of taking it to the next chapter. That's what's so fun at be, being investor backing entrepreneurs through through uh, through through revolution particularly what we're doing at this at this you know growth stage because that's when the companies really kind of go from startup to speed ups and from dozens of people to hundreds and sometimes places thousands of people you know that's when it's exciting for me to you know, to work with them and, and try to do what we can to help you know mentor and champion them right it's so interesting to think about what those seeds that are being planted today and and what they will become um, so, so you've mentioned Facebook a couple of times, and um, I know you have such a great focus on policy. So I'd love to hear your perspective of some of these big technology companies that are, you know, in such a difficult place today as it relates to policy and navigating their way through a very challenging environment. So. Well, it goes back to what I wrote in, in the, the third wave book. That was one of the things I did talk about. I actually said there would be a backlash against Silicon Valley, a backlash against big tech, because as they got bigger and more powerful, people would start having some concerns. I didn't know five years ago exactly what that would be. I had no idea that it you know, would have the influence it had, for example, uh, in the last few years on politics and things like that. But you could see it coming in terms of, of uh, growing uh, you know, scrutiny and, and concerns, whether it be a, kind of a legal antitrust kind of side or more or how do these platforms you know, work and how, what, what should the responsibility of the platform providers like a, like a Facebook or Twitter uh, be? So I think that was, again, you could sort of see it coming. Some of it because of the, you know, the growing uh, you know, influence of those platforms, really the success of those platforms. Some of it also was because it goes back to the second wave of the internet. I think the entrepreneurs there weren't really paying that much attention to policy, regulations, government. And, and, and it's, you know, as a result, we're kind of caught by surprise when people started expressing you know, concerns. I think one of the benefits of this next third wave, the entrepreneurs there do understand that, that it's sort of something more complicated to navigate. And I, I should stress, because every time you talk about you know, regulations, people say, oh, that's kind of a bummer. Regulations just slow things down and slow innovation down and better, you know, it's, it's tough for entrepreneurs. And there's some part of that that is true in, in different sectors. Uh, but I think there, there will be some regulations, some rules of the road around, for example, in healthcare, drug safety, you want to make sure the drugs actually 
help people, don't kill people. You want to make sure medical devices actually work. So there's always going to be some aspect to that. You may be able to tweak that to expedite innovation, but there's going to be some aspect to that. But when I talk about regulation of policy, it's not just the dealing with those challenges in terms of navigating regulations to, you know, as a go-to-market strategy. It's also what uh, policy can do to open up new opportunities. Uh, and we've seen that just in the in past couple of years with a, a couple of our revolution growth uh, portfolio companies. Uh, one I mentioned briefly earlier, you know, talk space in the telehealth space has seen an acceleration over the last year because some of the rules around telehealth have been relaxed because of the pandemic. As a result, the adoption both with doctors and, and, and patients has, has accelerated and that's created an opportunity for them. Uh, similarly, we backed a company called DraftKings a number of years ago, now quite successful uh, public company worth over $20 billion the last time I looked. Uh, and, and that's part of the reason that value was created was because some laws change in a number of states to allow gaming to people, you know, to essentially, you know, uh, you make wage on, you know, put wagers on different, different parts of the sporting uh, events. So that's a case where there was a change in policy that created new opportunities that allowed companies to accelerate their growth. So I think that mentality needs to be there, not just thinking of policy as a problem, but thinking also policy as, a, as an opportunity. Uh, and more broadly, in terms of innovation policy, I, I do think it's important that there be a focus on some of the things we've been talking about. How do you create a more inclusive innovation uh, economy and, and make sure people everywhere really have a shot and you're creating jobs and opportunity everywhere? I think that will be a, a focus of the, of the new administration. They've made that clear exactly how they do it and hopefully can do it in some bipartisan way. You know, time will tell. But I think that's going to be uh, very important that we continue to innovate as a country and, and kind of lead the way, continue to be the most innovative entrepreneurial nation in, in, in the world. That's only going to happen if we're backing entrepreneurs, uh, and particularly if we're backing entrepreneurs everywhere from a wide range of, of, uh, of backgrounds. So hopefully that will be, obviously, there's a lot of focus right now, as there should be on, on COVID-related uh, initiatives. But uh, you know, hopefully as the year progresses, there'll be a focus also on unleashing this next wave of American innovation. And when you um, particularly through revolution, as you all think about diversity and inclusion and, and broadening the funnel, if you will, um, you know, how do you tactically do that? What are the things that you do um, to find more women entrepreneurs to support, more people of color? Um, I mean, it's pretty clear there's no magic bullet, but I'd love to hear what you do every day to focus on that. Well, for starts with just being aware of it, you know, but again, both the problem, but also the opportunity. The problem is not enough women, not enough uh, people of color get capital. The opportunity is some of those will be the greatest entrepreneurs of this next generation and will generate the best investment returns. So if you're not broadening your aperture and, and opening your mind and expanding your networks, uh, you're going to miss out on some, uh, some, uh, some great opportunities. So it starts with that kind of, kind of the coin dropping, if you will, on, on that uh, idea. The second is to then have intentionality about how do you actually expand your networks to, to do this. One of the things we've been working with uh, uh, venture capitalists on the coast, like in Silicon Valley, is try to open up their aperture in terms of place, rise of rest, and also in terms of, of, uh, of people. And when it, recently in December, we did a we couldn't do another bus tour, obviously, because of the pandemic. We decided to do a virtual bus tour, uh, and we called it the Equity Edition, and we focused in this particular instance on Black founders. And we basically had a, so we had a call for, for uh, so we're going to do a national pitch competition. I think it was 400 different uh, entrepreneurs applied to pitch, and we obviously narrowed it down. As I know there are going to be some pitch competitions this, this afternoon. And then had uh, all the, the, the top ones pitch, and in the, we also got – I think it was 150 venture capitalists from all around the country, but particularly from Silicon Valley to join us, to learn about these companies, agree to mentor these companies, and in the process also introduce them to some entrepreneurs that they might decide to, to back. So that was an intentional effort to focus in that particular instance on, on, uh, on black founders. Also, when we do our, our bus tours, and we've done eight of those bus tours so far, visited 43 you know, cities, we are very intentional before we come. Our team spends many months in advance trying to understand the community, understand what's happening, understand some of the problems, but also some of the opportunities, figure out ways to drive more collaboration and, 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 and so forth. And in the process, also try to make sure we are looking at that community in a more inclusive way and inviting entrepreneurs, figuring out ways to reach out to entrepreneurs in that community uh, that do, do give us a more diverse mix of people pitching on the stage. As a result, just of that effort, 
I think the last day I saw about 40% of the winners of our Rise the Rest pitch competitions have been either women or people of, of color because it, we're just make, doing a, a, we're intentional about making sure they have the opportunity to be on stage. And then when they compete against other people say, well, that's, a, oh, that's an awesome one. That's clearly the winner. If you're not intentional and not figuring out ways to make sure you're reaching out to some of the different groups, accelerators or others, you know, university programs or a variety of ways to do it, then you likely are going to continue to just uh, do more of the same. And that's one of the problems, frankly, in, in Silicon Valley with a lot of the successful venture capitalists uh, do tend to think it's easier to invest in, in, in entrepreneurs in their neighborhood because they can be more helpful. It's also easier and safer, less risky to back entrepreneurs they already know, either they went to school with or they worked with at you know, Facebook or Google or some company like that. And, it, and, it, and there's some logic to that, I, yeah, I, 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 I grant you, but you're also essentially just kind of doing more of the same and you're not really opening your your aperture and expanding your network to identify promising entrepreneurs that you didn't happen to go to Stanford with you didn't have to work at Facebook with uh, which is by the way most of the most of the world and so how do, how do you kind of and not just you know, limit yourself to saying if you can't you know drive to them you're not interested in investing them and you know, the, you know, the zoom pandemic world has changed some of that uh, pers perspective. Uh, and I think that, as I said earlier, is is going to be helpful. So it really it says, you know, recognizing it's both a problem and an opportunity, and then being intentional about trying to figure out ways to expand your your network, expand your 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 aperture. And then once you do invest, really trying to make sure you are doing everything you can to support the entrepreneurs. That's our main thing at, at Revolution. It's not so much the, the Deciding entrepreneurs to invest in, in some ways, is the easy part. Helping them be successful is where we spend most of our time. And, and everybody backing entrepreneurs really needs to bring that mindset, not just thinking about a capital allocation, but how do you allocate your time and leverage your Rolodex and network to help these companies scale. And such an important lesson for entrepreneurs who are choosing their partners. You know, that, that really is um, what you hope for is a capital that comes with that level of support because oftentimes that is what makes the difference. Um, I think we will have succeeded when that capital realizes it can't afford not to be out in the rest of the country because there's so much happening there. So that is what we are endeavoring uh, to create for sure. And I certainly don't want to let the hour pass without twisting your arm to tell you that we absolutely want your Rise of the Rest bus as soon as it fires up to make its way to Houston. We would love to host you here. We look forward to being there. We, we actually had, a, had our ninth tour planned for last year. Uh, it was not including Houston, but it was Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Wichita, Northwest Arkansas, St. Louis. Uh, and we had to obviously postpone that. So that, that will be the next one. We haven't yet picked new dates because we're waiting to get a little more clarity on where things are with vaccines and other kinds of things. But uh, we look forward to you know, you know, visiting. And, and we actually do have one uh, Rise of Rest investment in, uh, in Houston already, a company called Good Fair. And we're looking to make other investments too. We are happy to, that you are. Um, I want to go back to our poll. Uh, we have over 300 people watching us this morning, and about 80% of them are entrepreneurs, and they're peppering us with uh, incredibly thoughtful questions. So I want to share a couple of those. Um, one is, what are your thoughts on the importance of an early adopter culture? And, you know, from corporations to consumers, um, Early customers are important. What are your thoughts in that regard? Absolutely, I think that part of the challenge with uh, any new you know company is how do you take your idea and give it light, give it lift off, give it give it you know create some uh, momentum around that. Uh, and the initial investors do matter in terms of kind of creating credibility and credentialing you and, you know, getting people, oh, well, that sounds interesting because, you know, that group uh, invested. Uh, but also the initial customers and or partners you have are critically important. The last ingredient is the team you assemble. Entrepreneurs are the team sport. And sometimes the entrepreneurs themselves get too much attention. It's really, and it's, a, it's, a, it's like sports. It ultimately comes down to the teams you, you uh, assemble. Uh, so those first customers and those first partners are important, both to give you feedback and to create some momentum that leads to other people you know, wanting to also believe in you and invest in you or, or you know, buy your, your, your product or, or service. It's critically important. And, and one of the frustrations, I should say, that I have traveling around the 
you know, the country, and it goes back to something I alluded to at the, at the beginning, is, is the many of the, the cities we visit are too fragmented. They are too siloed. They aren't particularly collaborative. And, and hopefully events like this really do help, you know, get people in Houston to recognize this is a moment and it really it should seize it. And how do you, as a community, kind of take your, your efforts around startups and entrepreneurs to the to the next level. And it has to get the big companies involved and the universities involved and the mayor involved and, and as well as obviously the entrepreneurs and, and, and the investors involved. Everybody has to play a role. And my, my message to the bigger companies, some of which I'm sure are, are listening, many I know are partners with with uh, with HX, is it this is critical to the future of your community and your ability to attract and keep talent is tied to that. So there, there's sort of a selfish interest as well as you're much likelier to have a sense of where the market you're in is going if you are watching closely what those crazy entrepreneurs are are kicking you know kind of cooking up and and, and and right now it gives you some insights that actually help inform your business and you're likelier not to make the mistakes that so many large companies make of of focusing too much on on kind of you know where you stand and not so much on on uh, on where you're going so whether you care about your own company and its ultimate success 25 years from now or you care about your community and where it's going to be 25 years from now you know it all to me leads back to what can you do leveraging your platform uh, to support this next generation of entrepreneurs and make sure in the process Houston rises uh, as a startup even more as a startup city and your company uh, becomes even more you know competitive because of the insights you glean uh, from your your interactions with with the entrepreneurs you have an opportunity through events like this to bump into people and ideas which will make you smarter uh, wiser and less likely to be disrupted and more likely to to kind of figure out a path forward that makes your company even more successful going forward well if there's one thing that houston should be able to get right and and do exceptionally well it's partnership because i think we have countless examples of that over many many years um, and and there's a true willingness and desire um, one of the things I see, though, is that big companies don't always know quite how to partner with um, startups. With the best of intentions, you know, bureaucracy and all of that tends to get in the way. So talk about what you've seen and, and what advice would you give those corporate entities in terms of how to actually do it well? Well, it certainly depends on the nature of your business and, and kind of what it, in your community it kind of relates to that business. But uh, I think it, you know, we've seen a number of examples, some of which we've talked about in these playbooks, Rise of the Rest playbooks that we talked about earlier that are freely available on the revolution.com site. So we've seen a number of different examples. Some companies have joined together to create you know, in the case of HX, kind of a, a fund of funds to back you know, funds that can then back entrepreneurs, some of which will be in the area. And that's a way to be be supportive and also potentially glean some insights. Others have built almost like a concierge program within their company. So there is a single point of contact for entrepreneurs to connect. And then somebody within the company kind of helps them you know, navigate others. In one, one case, I remember in um, Memphis, I think it was when we visited uh, Service Master was headquartered there and they'd actually taken their lobby of their building to create a, an accelerator for companies that were essentially in their own business. So they were in the lobby backing entrepreneurs that were doing things that could could disrupt the core Service Master franchise. And that was a great example of being supportive of those entrepreneurs, some of which could end, they could end up investing in, maybe some end up in acquiring in, but all of them kind of likely learn from. Uh, and rather than have it someplace else, they put it in their lobby, which also set, a, I think, an important signal to the community and an important signal to their own employees that they're you know, they're interested in in understanding kind of where, where things are going and want to kind of lean into the future. So there's a bunch of different things that a bunch of different companies have, have, have done. Every company has to decide for themselves, you know, what what their priorities you know, in this regard should be. But I think it starts with you know, some of the points we made earlier, just recognizing the critical role startups and new companies play in your community and the critical role of, of associating with them, connecting with them plays and informing your own thinking in terms of your own business. If you can't beat them, join them, right? No, exactly. <laughs> um, another question from the audience is, you know, COVID has changed the way we work and collaborate in business in so many ways. Um, but how should entrepreneurs and startups change and evolve the way they work um, to build their businesses and, and accelerate their growth? 
a great question. And I think the honest answer is nobody quite knows because we're still in the middle of this and it'll take a few years for it all to settle out. Uh, but I would point out there are a number of very successful companies, uh, including WordPress, had, had over a thousand employees pre-pandemic that were entirely remote. So this notion of remote work is, is, is accelerated because of the pandemic. But there were some companies that had decided that that was the way they wanted to operate, and in part because that would give them the broadest access to a pool of, of, of talent. There are more companies in large cities that are saying that that kind of makes sense. And, and even again, pre-pandemic, some of the big Silicon Valley you know, giants, including you know Facebook and Google, had already opened up other offices in Detroit and Pittsburgh and and, and other other cities. Then we need to have a more distributed uh, approach to our, our our workforce. We can't just have everybody all in in, in one one office in in, uh, in in Silicon Valley. Now they're taking the next step and saying, makes sense at least for some like Facebook. If you want to permanently work from somebody else. We're good with that. You know, we need to figure out exactly how it all works. But you know, we don't we aren't going to require you post pandemic uh, to return to 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 the you know the Bay Area if you want to live somewhere else. You will figure out a way to make that that work, which I think is you know f accelerating this whole rethinking, reimagining of, of 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 the workforce and gives people a lot more flexibility and gives entrepreneurs a lot more. You know, flexibility. So it kind of depends on where you are in your evolution, what the key dynamics are. There's obviously some companies, particularly things that are doing work around, you know, biotechnology labs and so forth. There's some, you know, need to be, you know, together with other people. There's others, that, particularly software businesses, that can be somewhat more uh, distributed. I think it's more just saying this is the moment being more flexible in terms of your hiring, saying maybe for this next job, for whatever it you know, might be, instead of assuming they have to live in Houston, in this case, maybe somebody living someplace else can do that job. And, and that would allow us to attract somebody with, with a skill set that perhaps is better than somebody we could attract uh, locally and give that person and their family more, uh, more, more flexibility. And the last point I make is I think all organizations are gonna need to figure out well, as we come out of this, hopefully, as the year progresses and vaccines get distributed and so forth, that it will you know, be, you know, over the over the next year or so. What is the new normal? I don't think we want to go back to what the way it was before. Uh, we want to create a different dynamic and, and a kind of a, a new normal. And for companies, I think that for most companies will result in more of a hybrid workforce where some people are in the office, some people are working remotely. Many people will bridge that. Some some days they're in the office, some days they're working remotely. Some will be permanent uh, remote workers, some will be permanent you know, office workers. It will, you know, having more of a flexible approach likely is the best way to attract and, and retain talent. But it's gonna create some interesting, I think, dynamics, team issues, culture issues, even trust issues. Because I think it's relatively easy to run an organization if everybody's in the same place. And it's also proven to be surprisingly easy to run an organization if everybody is remote. It's going to be hard, I think, if it's half and half. It's like half the people are there and half the people are remote. People who are remote then might start feeling like they're missing out. They're not in the room where it happens, as they said in the Hamilton you know, play, which then creates some trust and culture issues. So I think as we move back into this new normal, uh, it's going to be tricky to figure out how to you know, leverage what's the lessons learned this year in terms of what's possible with remote work, uh, but still figure out some way to knit it together to get the right you know, team dynamic, create the, the right cultures. Well, I think you're exactly right. And, um, you know, we certainly have seen that with schools, for example, the challenge of, of a hybrid model, you know, is far worse than having everybody remote. And I think to your earlier point, that in itself creates a whole set of opportunities and implications for startups and technologies to help address it. So, um, it was, Absolutely. I, last week I was talking with Michael Crow, who's the president of Arizona State University, ASU, you know, super innovative in terms of the things they're doing to create more accessibility. And basically they, they're creating structures so people have the, the flexibility and they operate them almost as virtual campuses and physical campuses and give people you know that flexibility. They've been working on that for a decade. So as a result, they're better positioned than most uh, to execute, you know, kind of you know going forward. But it requires that fresh thinking. And as you're saying, recognizing it's, it's not going to be easy. It's going to create some new challenges uh, and you just have to recognize that going in you have kind of eyes wide open well and for for kids um you know i'm not sure that they'll necessarily remember what was before i mean if if this is you know a tenth or a fifth of your life for the last year your perception of what is normal will be very different so um it will be interesting to see 
I'm, I'm conscious of our time. Um, if uh, you look back into your uh, very clear crystal ball and uh, look forward, what are you excited about? What are you concerned about? Well, much of we've covered. I'm super excited that uh, some of the things I've been working on for a better part of a decade and really hoping we'd see some uh, acceleration on, including the idea of the rise of rest, more capital going to more entrepreneurs and in, in more places, doing it in a more inclusive way. I really do think that that this this is the moment. And because of this terrible pandemic, there there is you know, a lot of people have, it's kind of a shake the snow globe moment and things are kind of settling out. Nobody's exactly sure you know, what, what it's going to be, but it's going to be different. And I think one of the areas that's going to be different is it's, you know, the, the rise of the rest will become more of a phenomenon in the next decade. Uh, and more entrepreneurs will be starting companies in, in places like Houston, not feeling like they have to leave Houston to go to San Francisco because that's the way to access capital. That's the way to access other, other you know, kind of, uh, you know, talent. I think that's a big deal. I think the third wave will accelerate, you know, particularly in sectors like healthcare. If nothing else, we've learned from this pandemic that our healthcare system needs some some work in terms of you know, kind of being able to innovate more quickly, being able to deliver uh, products and services more conveniently, be able to do that with more affordability, and also do that with better better you know health outcomes. And so, a lot of efforts now going into that sector. As I said before, I think the entrepreneurs who are looking at those opportunities need to recognize that the playbook for that third wave is different than the playbook for the second wave and things like partners and policy that we talked about are going to be important. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. Where, where I'm more nervous about it, again, we've, we've kind of covered this, is how do we make sure as we enter this new chapter, uh, we do it in a more inclusive way. We actually start bridging some of the divides in our country as opposed to further exacerbating. There's a lot of talk about income inequality, which I'm concerned about. I'm just as concerned, though, about opportunity inequality. How do we make sure that we are, are, are creating the jobs of the future and training people for those uh, for those jobs and doing that all across the country, not just in a, in a, in a few places? So that's an area where it's, um, I'm watching and also trying to make sure it goes back to one of your earlier questions uh, that we strike the right balance in terms of uh, what technology enables and also what society really wants. And, and, and that does re result in, a, in part of that rethinking of big tech, Silicon Valley, you know, things like that. So there's some, some complicated issues. I, I, as an entrepreneur, I view it more as an optimist, the glass is half full, not, not half empty. So I think the momentum we're seeing on the things that I mentioned that I'm optimistic about, I'm very encouraged by, but I am certainly eyes wide open that we, you know, that we have some you know, serious challenges, certainly in the short run with the, with the, you know, reigning in the pandemic and getting our economy back on, 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 on track, but coming out of that, you know, how do we also create a new normal there? The, you know, a year ago, uh, I was in a lot of, you know, conferences where people were talking about capitalism and, and maybe it's not inclusive enough. And maybe uh, in terms of the startup community, for the reason we mentioned, it's not inclusive enough. And there, there's this, you know, a lot of people that are, are frustrated because their their jobs are being disrupted by innovators somewhere else. And, and it's not good for their family. It's not good there for their community. There's there is some anger building around that. That was true a year ago. Uh, when we come out of this pandemic, that's still true. And so how do we not go back to where it was Normal wasn't working for a lot of people in a lot of places. How do we create a better normal that, that is more inclusive, that leads to a, a stronger set of communities and overall a, a stronger, more united country? Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. And, and it is, um, we are very much at an inflection point, snow globe moment, as you said. Um, just uh, parting wisdom or advice for our audience uh, as entrepreneurs or investors or parts of the Houston community at large so focused on this particular opportunity and moment in time. Well, it's separate. I think for the entrepreneurs, not just because of this particular moment, but just because of my own entrepreneurial journey, you know, don't give up, you know, believe in, believe in your idea. And, and, you know, there are a number of years when, you know, after AOL got started, we struggled. We almost went under a couple of times. And I did get a call from my parents at one point. I was in my, I guess, late 20s. Uh, and I kind of said, well, it seems like it's not working. You know, <laughs> you think maybe it's time to like get a real job. Uh, and yeah, they were just obviously loved me and trying to be supportive. And but I, I, you know, I stuck with it. And you know, it did take us a decade before we finally broke through. And it was a frankly, a tough decade, but eventually we broke through and eventually created a, 
uh, a valuable, significant, you know, impactful you know, company. So for the message of the entrepreneurs is, is if you believe in what you're doing, you believe it's a battle worth fighting, a mountain worth climbing, don't give up. And even if you are always going to be skeptics who say it can't be done, you know, the entrepreneurs are the ones who figure out some way to get it done. I would say second for the investors, this is a moment to, to exactly what we talked about before to, to realize that backing entrepreneurs in places like Houston and also backing entrepreneurs, including women, people of color that often don't have the same uh, access to capital. This is a moment and there's a lot that can be done both in terms of generating returns and also generating positive uh, impact in, in, uh, in your community. And the final point for the companies and others, other nonprofits, other folks that are, that are part of this, uh, it requires collaboration. I love the African proverb, if you wanna go quickly, you can go alone, alone. If you wanna go far, you must go together. So if Houston, you wanna go far, you must go together. You must seize this moment. You must support this next generation of entrepreneurs. And you must realize, as I said at the very beginning, you know, it's not a problem, it's, a, it's an opportunity. Thank you, that's uh, incredible advice. And I think this conference is a great example of Houston going together. And um, we're just so grateful for you being a part of this, but more importantly, for all you're doing for entrepreneurs and for our country. Um, it's, uh, you're such a great leader and we're thankful there's so many people following your lead. I also want to thank our audience and all of you that are participating in the event and those of you who have put this together um, it is really another milestone, I think, in our success, our progress towards success of building this robust uh, ecosystem. So again, thanks, Steve. It's been such a pleasure to visit with you. And Thank I you so much. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you later. Stay safe. You too.